Thai UM, we think that discussion and debate on capacity development in migration would never be complete, comprehensive, and inclusive if they don't include the main actors of human mobility, that is to say, the migrant themselves. In this context, and consistent with the established practice of the IDM, and uh, to provide the migrant with the opportunity to make their voice heard and to interact directly with other stakeholders, I'm glad to present this morning this session, through which we will listen to interesting self-empowerment stories and to concrete experience of migrants empowering themselves and contributing to capacity development of their fellow mi migrants and ultimately to their host and origin countries. Yesterday, one of our panelists representing the UNICEF, Mr. Khan, referred to a migrant, a young migrant, with the name of Anas Ansar, addressing policymakers in a gathering in June. I'm quoting, the young migrant said, one way of making migration safer and better for young people is to have us part of the discussion. That's exactly what we are trained and aiming from this session, is to make the migrants around me uh, part of the dis discussion to provide room for interaction, discussion with, uh, with you. I'm sharing the podium with three distinguished capacity development agents, if I may say so. Uh, first there, Mr. Jibril Diallo, who serves the African Renaissance and Diaspora Network, ARDN, as President and Chief Executive Officer. In this role, Dr. Diallo leads the ARDN Global Pathway to Solutions Initiative, which aims to popularize the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and spread the goodwill of the United Nations in close consultation and collaboration with partners, including the Office of Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Then I have uh, on my left, Ms. Zrinka Bralu, who is the CEO of Migrant Organize, a grassroots national organization that provides shared organizing platform for migrants and refugees to connect, build common ground, and grow their power. Ms. Zrinka is a refugee from Sarajevo, where she was a journalist and where she worked with leading war correspondent in the 19th. She served as commissioner on the Independent Asylum Commission, the most comprehensive review of the UK protection system. Last but not least, on my right, Ms. Lucia Brulard, who is the founder of the executive director of the NGO Prevention Madalenas in Switzerland which promote actions related to domestic violence, sexual harassment, and sexual exploitation and human trafficking. Lucia Amelia was a victim of human trafficking when she was 20 years old, coming from Brazil to Switzerland, when she be where she believed she was signing a contract to be an artist. Her own experience was her inspiration to create Madalinas and work with support, information, and prevention, prevention related to human trafficking. Lucia Amelia is also a multi-talented artist awarded nationally and internationally for her literature work. Without much ado, and after welcoming my panelists, I will hand over the floor to Dr. Jibri Diallo to lead us through what I hope would be an interactive discussion. Mr. Diallo, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here and uh, help to have as much of an interaction with you all as possible. 
because our goal in the time to come is to see how we can have perspectives, how we can have lessons that are learned uh, that can help you, uh, member states, that can help you, representatives of social, uh, civil society organizations to uh, move forward in terms of the interconnection between uh, the actors, the actresses in the field and uh, you, the member states. Uh, we have two, the way forward is as follows. One, uh, we will have our two panelists share uh, their perspectives as to how they came about uh, being where they are as uh, migrants, what are the challenges, what are the difficulties they're being faced with, how did they manage to overcome those uh, difficulties, what role do they see you, uh, especially uh, member states, uh, could uh, play, and then uh, also um, what is the interconnection with uh, the work that uh, IOM is doing in terms of giving us this kind of space. So um, we will uh, maybe uh, start uh, with you, uh, Zinka Bralo, and then uh, go on to Elena. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Um, I will try to do um, the riskiest thing, and that is to use a, a clicker and a PowerPoint. Um, and we'll see how, how that works. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here and uh, very aware of my privilege um, today and to be here and to, to have a voice um, in this um, meeting in this city and, this, and have this platform. Um, I'm Chief Executive of Migrants Organize, which is based in London with ambitious of becoming international force. Um, we do do work across United Kingdom and also um, um, visit other countries and cities and provide training and share our experiences. Um, so that's what I'd like to do in the next 10 minutes and for the rest of the session. Um, there we go, challenge. Is it on? Oh. So I was born in Sarajevo in Bosnia and Herzegovina um, uh, many, many years ago. And when I was a teenager, I danced in Winter Olympics opening ceremony. So I'm somewhere there in the middle circle. And, I, and I'm still very emotional and tearful every time I see any um, uh, Olympic ceremony because it reminds me of the best that we can do um, as a world together. And I had a very happy childhood. And um, that happy childhood became this um, just eight years um, after the Olympics. And this is my street. This is where my mom still lives. And some of you who are as young as I am will remember that there was a terrible war in my country and um, lots of destruction. I was a young journalist and I ended up um, working with international war correspondents because I spoke English. And they helped me leave in 1993. And this year is something that I call my flip year, which means that I was 25 um, years living in Bosnia and now I'm 25 years living in London. And so I'm half and half, but from now on, um, if I stay in London, I'm gonna be slightly more British um, than I am Bosnian, at least in terms of timeline. When I first came to Britain, I was completely unaware of what I call the unwelcome committee, which is the tabloid press. And I wasn't aware of how migrants and refugees are portrayed and understood, because I had this confidence about not having done anything wrong and leaving the country that's being torn apart and the city that was under the siege. And not so much that I had a sense of entitlement, but I, I hoped that the world understood. And perhaps because I was a journalist, I thought that people are watching the news. But tabloid press was putting a completely different spin on that experience. And, and that was really difficult to understand. And over the years, um, that got worse. And, um, 
couple of years ago, the Migration Observatory at Oxford University has done um, a study. They looked at 43 million words in, in British newspapers. And what they found is that the term most commonly associated with the term migrant was illegal. And, and that's how public conversation was being conducted. Fortunately, that is not the only public conversation that's happening in the United Kingdom, and that's what I do, and that's where, where Migrants Organized come, comes in. There is this whole welcome movement that is uh, largely invisible in the newspapers because people who do good work do it quietly. And uh, good news is not news, and that's part of the problem. So I um, understand it as my mission as a recovering journalist to take on that challenge. So in London and in, across the United Kingdom, what we do, we try to provide spaces where migrants and refugees work together with British citizens and all other immigrants on welcoming and creating welcoming spaces. So what we do a lot of the time is we listen to people because people with experiences usually are the ones who will have the seeds of what the solutions are. So we listen, what are the experiences of migrants? And four doctors walked into my office 10 years ago and they said, we need to pass these really difficult exams to be doctors. Seven years later, we ended up supporting three and a half thousand doctors and dentists from 98 countries by organizing training for them to pass these very difficult exams to work um, as doctors, and they're now working in our National Health Service, which is fantastic. And more importantly for our government, they're paying taxes quite a lot. Another way of celebrating and changing the narrative is to uh, recognize people who do fantastic work in the community. So we have set up Women on the Move Awards, and every year in the Royal Festival Hall, another very important cultural space, the nation nominates women, migrant and refugee women that they know who are doing fantastic work in the community. These two women who won an award are both working in charities. Um, the young woman is going to be a doctor. They've both been trafficked. And these are stories that are really inspiring other people because they're not stories of victimhood, they're stories of resilience. And then we make sure that they get platform in the press. We're big on Netflix. This is Bashar, who's one of our Syrian refugees who's um, just got uh, his first job um, after he got papers. We also work with celebrities and artists, making sure that they use their voices to amplify the stories in a positive way. And the young woman is now uh, in this picture is now working for Mayor of London. We work with businesses. This was a big campaign by Jigsaw Fashion Label for which they won advertising award, which they splash all over London Underground, proclaiming that immigration is good. And why not? And we also work with Ben and Jerry Ice Cream. He produced this refugees welcome um, pint of ice cream and all the donation went, went to International Rescue Committee. We do this work only because we have hundreds of volunteers. Last year we had 236 volunteers who mentor people, <coughs> teach them English, um, go to doctor appointments with them, and as a result we were given Queen's Voluntary Service Award, which is the highest recognition in the United Kingdom you can get for voluntary service. We work with churches, faith groups, where they raised funding for us. We've just become a community sponsors. This is a group of staff at Amnesty International who raised 40,000 pounds and our first family is coming on community sponsorship from Iraq on the 6th of November. And they're super excited to be welcoming them. The most important element of integration work that we do is not only economic, cultural, and social integration, but also civic integration, and that is the recognition of the fact that we were citizens somewhere else, so we can continue being citizens in our receiving countries. So we had lots of elections in the United Kingdom in the last couple of years, and we um, started this um, initiative called Promote the Migrant Vote, where migrants and refugees, even if they cannot vote, organize events in which they can have conversations with people who are voting to bring down um, stigma, to change stereotypes, uh, to challenge um, fake news. 
this is Young Vic Theatre, who declare, they declare themselves to be the Theatre of Sanctuary, and if you went to go and see the show, you could register to vote. So we worked on a campaign together with them. These are my colleagues going out and encouraging people to register to vote. We work with um, authorities, local authorities, London, national government, cities across Europe. This is our mayor of London. And when he was campaigning, we asked him, if you're elected, will you give us a deputy mayor for integration? And he said, yes, I will. So we send a member of staff on secondment, and as a result, we now have integration strategy for London called All of Us, where our voices were represented. And then the reason why I love compact, this particular compact, is because it has a very inclusive, positive, and progressive language that helps us do that kind of work locally. And this is a local authority in Haringey in North London, which has started a movement called Haringey Welcome. And we work with young people and children in schools um, who produce posters, but more importantly, we work with local authority and they're looking at their practices as, as to how they can be more inclusive and reduce the barriers for people who are coming to the country. And of course, um, all of this needs to be fun because the shortest distance between two people is laughter. And of course, um, we use a lot of art in what we do and we have a poetry workshop and we publish poetries and that's how we teach English as well. So because he couldn't be here today and because it's my job to platform some of these voices, I brought to you a poem about belonging that 11-year-old Sultan wrote in our poetry club and it's only one minute and I thought I would end on that note and share that poem with you right now. Lucia, Amelia, Brula, vous avez eu une uh, expérience venant du Brésil, résident en Suisse. Peut-être que vous pouvez aussi partager avec nous uh, votre perspective. À vous la parole. Je remercie d'être ici aujourd'hui à OIM et je remercie aussi à vous tous d'être ici ce matin. C'est difficile d'y parler, je tremble, j'ai le corps qui saute, mais je suis vivant et je suis là. <rire> et je suis très joyeuse d'y être ici et partager mon expérience de vie. Je suis née à São Paulo, c'est le sud du Brésil. Aujourd'hui, j'ai 51 ans et je vais vous raconter mon histoire vécue à 30 ans en arrière. Quand j'étais adolescent, 17 à 18 ans, j'ai imaginé qu'être émigré, qui émigré était synonyme d'enrichissement, enrichissement instantané, d'indépendance et instabilité financière, de réussite. Aujourd'hui, à 51 ans, d'après ma propre expérience vécue, j'ai la conclusion qu'habiter dans un pays étranger n'était pas synonyme de richesse, de bonne vie, de bon travail. Vivre en étranger, c'est synonyme de lutte, de travail acharné, sacrifié, solitude, courage, intégration, adaptation, et nous devons nous réinventer à chaque jour. Pour vivre loin de notre pays d'origine, nous devons renoncer à beaucoup de choses. À nous sacrifier pour les autres dans le but d'avoir une vie meilleure que celle-là que nous avons pensé être pas bien là où nous avons vécu. Mais cependant pour une jeune fille avec une tête pleine de rêves, et peu d'informations sur migration internationale, il est impossible de clarifier les choses. Toute personne qui s'aventure à l'extérieur de son propre pays ne remet pas en question les difficultés auxquelles elle sera confrontée. Elle n'a qu'un objectif en tête, qui ses rêves doivent être réalisés.
Quand j'ai quitté le Brésil avec un contrat pour travailler comme artiste en Suisse, je ne savais pas que mon cauchemar ne faisait que commencer. Des jeunes comme moi sont rentrés dans les pays en déposant leur espoir dans un contrat artistique d'une durée de huit mois. On s'attendait plus tard à la prostitution et à la consommation obligée d'alcool, des drogues, à la humilité de toutes ces formes et des diverses autres exigences de l'employeur. La usure émotionnelle causée par la nostalgie du pays, la nostalgie des proches, les difficultés avec la langue, l'adaptation climatique et gastronomique, la solitude, souffert quotidienne, étaient les principaux causes des suicides, des dépressions chez les jeunes artistes. Des humanités signifie l'absence de humanité, atrocité, cruauté. C'est le mot que j'utilise pour décrire les traitements réservés. Je vous parle à 30 ans en arrière, aux artistes des cabarets en Suisse, des femmes provenues du Maroc, du Brésil, de la Thaïlande, d'Afrique. J'ai connu. J'étais témoin de situations critiques de collègues qui ont été sauvagement battus par les propriétaires des cabarets ou par les clients. Il existait de nombreux cas de morts. Nous avons reçu des nouvelles des artistes trouvés mortes dans les chambres, dans les rues, dans les forêts, les corps retrouvés dans les bois. Et la cause des décès était répertoriée comme suicide ou surdose. Mais nous savions que c'était la punition pour la désobéissance. Beaucoup de mères pleurent jusqu'à aujourd'hui pour leurs filles. Les nationalités sont différentes, mais les pleurs sont universelles. En racontant cette histoire ici à la ONU, je me rends compte que 30 ans sont passés. Mon implication avec les thèmes abus sexuels, exploration sexuelle d'enfants, la traite des êtres humains et la violence domestique a été si intense au cours de sept années que j'ai fondé la ONG Prévention Madalenas pour agir à titre préventif afin d'éviter que des autres jeunes comme moi, des gens de mon pays, sont trompés pour suivre les mêmes chemins que moi. Avec le Madalena, nous effectuons un travail préventif en visitant les écoles, en apportant des informations importantes aux étudiants qui risquent d'accepter des propositions de travail à l'étranger sans savoir si la source d'offres est fiable. Notre ONG souhaite encourager les femmes, les jeunes étudiants et les femmes et les hommes de manière générale à achever leurs études et chercher à investir dans une formation professionnelle qui lui permette de vaincre et vivre au Brésil. Immigrer, oui, mais avec la préparation adéquate. Je sais que le combat est grand. Et dans notre combat, nous gagnerons Seulement si on utilise l'éducation, la culture et les arts et la littérature comme armes de combat. Merci. Uh, the two statements are supposed to be snapshots into experiences uh, that uh, migrants have in their individual uh, communities within the framework of uh, the theme of uh, this uh, uh, conference, how do we uh, strengthen uh, partnerships? Uh, how do we go from these perspectives into like a Zoom lens kind of style? And from where I sit, uh, my organization, we are present in uh, 80 countries, and we try to see how we go from this to enter into the broader picture of connecting 
uh, migrants with SDGs. And as I mentioned yesterday, uh, we're using three entry points. Because if you take my own continent of origin, Africa, I'm a national of Senegal, um, most of the people who are candidates to living the African continent are young people. So what programs do we do in order to make it worth their while for the youth not to vote with their own feet in order to uh, leave the con continent and go to what they think would be the El Dorado, that kind of pull and uh, push kind of factor. So uh, we're pushing to establish right now an uh, SDGs Youth Corps, Volunteer Youth Corps, and some of you governments here present are supporting our initiatives in that connection at two levels one. Uh, many of the African countries have voluntary work camp associations. So how do we do exchange programs through those uh, work camp associations? And then two, uh, yesterday in the discussions, uh, when the um, e-diaspora uh, was uh, mentioned during uh, the lunch break, uh, a lot of experience were shared about how immigrants from where they are uh, can contribute their knowledge to their countries of origin at two levels. One, uh, being physically present in the countries of origin, and examples were mentioned. I mentioned that when I was director of communication of UNDP, uh, we had a major program which is still going on called Top 10, uh, transfer of knowledge among expatriate nationals. But then there are immigrants who are established in uh, countries where they cannot necessarily move uh, physically to be in their countries of origin. But now, with the modern media, with technology, they can give so much of their own time from where they are. Uh, so that uh, within that uh, framework, uh, we have the short-term and the uh, medium and long-term initiative regarding the youth. I'd very much like to hear from you all in terms of your perspectives on how you can meaningfully engage the youth. Because I am a first-generation literate. Uh, my parents have not been to school. I cannot go back to my hometown and say to the youth, you should stay where you are. You should not go to Europe. They say, well, why, how about yourself? How, why, how come you are where you are? So that it has to take more than being a professor or lecturer talking to the youth. It has to be worth their own while in their own terms. Second point is one of the biggest challenges that we have in right, uh, right now in Africa is really the restlessness in higher education. That's where you have a lot of the strikes. That's where you have a lot of programs. So we have an SDGs university initiative that is having partnerships between African universities and universities in particular in the United States. 350 universities, historically black, and uh, are willing to do this program. This has been going on uh, for 10 years. And within that framework, as you know, there are three types of universities in the uh, continent. There are well-established universities, which draw a lot of the resources. But then you have new universities, and then you have rural universities. And the idea is to leave no university behind. But then when you're talking about universities, you have to also go down and make sure that early childhood, primary, and secondary education are taken care of. So we're taking universities as low-hanging fruit, but then we go down to uh, secondary education. The third and final point, I always mention to my friends that the mayor or the governor are the first points of contact for the populations. So that we've had ex experience, and I'm very, very uh, grateful to IOM to enable us to share our experience. We have an organization called the Global Alliance of Mayors and Leaders from Africa and of African descent, which is the largest organization of mayors of color that has been fostering this relationship between Africa and people of African descent. So when you take those three points, the youth, education, local governance, then you wrap them around through two languages, sport and culture. Then that enables you to move forward and try to achieve the 17 uh, sustainable uh, development goals by 2030, working with the United Nations system, working with you, our governments, our representatives, working with civil society organizations.